Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a King Killer Chronicle reread podcast. We are your hosts, Will and Phoenix. Let's get into it. Welcome to Tales from the Waystone Season 2, Episode 34. Relationships would be a lot simpler if humans weren't so complex where we will be looking at chapters 72 and 73 of The Wise Man's Fear through the lens of The Fly and the Ointment. Before we begin, A, thank you all for listening. B, we'd love if you would rate and review the podcast. Algorithms suck. We would like more people to hear us. If you would also like more people to hear us, we'd love it if you'd give us a hand. C, in case you didn't know, or you don't listen to the very, very, very end of the podcast, in which case you are missing out because there is an outtake on every single one of these. But we do have a Patreon, patreon.com slash waystonepod, if you would like to help support us and have the means to do so. On to all the disclaimer stuff. Each week we will be examining a section of the wise man's fear through a chosen lens and figuring out what we can take from the text and reply to our real lives. We will also take some time to explore models of practical wisdom from the text with an Aristotelian for Nemos of the Week. After that, we will expand our understanding of our own world with an interesting fact. Then we will share a recommended thing of the week. Finally, we will wrap things up with seven words from the book and seven words from our own lives. Before we begin, let's get some disclaimers out of the way. First of all, we are in no way affiliated with Patrick Rothfuss or his publisher, Daw Books. We do not have any inside information. We do not have anything other than any rumors, and I'm probably late to any given one of those. <laughs> Second, we assume that you've read the books or you don't care about spoilers. Also a word to our community, it can be summed up as, don't kick anybody in the slushy. And now it is time for a 45 second recap. And as a reminder, if I go over 45 seconds, I'd have to eat cherries. And I hate cherries, so we're staying under 45. Seconds or minutes? Seconds. <laughs> I know how the game's played. Considering that we no longer have any cherries in the house, it would be a shame if you had to go buy some. Good thing I'm going to keep it under 45. Seconds. Seconds, yes. All right. In three, two, one, go. Koth tails Denna through the streets of the city and witnesses her play duenna, when upon a poor girl she takes pity. Denna gives the girl lessons on the shape of the world and the truth of the oldest profession in which she's embroiled. On a later date, Denna shares with Koth her song and hopes that she'll relate to the images and words she strings along. To Kvoth's horror, the song is of Lanray, a topic which he implores her to neither sing nor say. The two leave apart, both their prides wounded, and egos bruised as their hearts because of secrets occluded. 30.61 seconds. No cherries for me. Told you I'd keep it under 45 seconds. I know, but I'm sure that our audience would love it if you had to eat cherries sometime. They'd love it if you had to eat raspberries, but I don't see you going out of your way to shoot yourself in the foot. We don't go out of our way to shoot ourselves in the foot. If we did, we'd probably eat the anathema way more often because it's entertaining. Probably. So I am not going to make a sacrifice that you wouldn't make. <sniffs> anyway, let's go ahead and dive in. We start with chapter 72, Horses. There's a lot of horse metaphors in here. Like we see Kvothe talking about running around lathered up like a horse. We see him taking the horse elevator. And then there will be a later equine metaphor that Denna will employ with the unnamed girl. Our characters here are really primarily Kvothe and Denna, some unnamed attacker in an alleyway, and the girl that Denna saves from the unnamed man. So one of the things that I noticed is, like, there's always this sort of weird line that Kvothe walks when he goes looking for Denna. And I think this is the first time that he's crossed it from going to look for someone to actually being really creepy. The word you're looking for is stalking? Yeah. It's one thing to go look for someone and then to say, hey, how you doing? In this case, though, he finds her and then he starts tailing her surreptitiously. And it just feels really ooky to me. It feels like a violation of trust. Yeah. So he suspects that Denna is going to visit her patron. We don't really know what her business is that night. Neither does Kvothe. 
And he makes no effort to approach her and ask. Instead, he just says, well, I'm just going to follow her because, well, I'm curious. And then as soon as she moves outside of the safe streets, he starts trying to justify it as, well, I'm protecting her. He tries to justify a lot of things in this section as, oh, well, I am protecting her. And I can't let her see me because otherwise she'd be mad at me. As if that isn't a clue that he's already crossed a line. He's a little more upfront with, I wish I could say that this was something that I agonized over, but I really didn't. He's trying to make himself sound better while he's not actually making himself sound better. Like he's trying to say, I've grown since then, but I'm not sure he really has. Yeah, I think there's a difference between admitting to your faults and explaining them versus trying to justify them. And here I think he's trying to justify. I think if we're looking at this objectively, Quoth is completely in the wrong throughout this whole chapter. Both chapters, really. Fair enough. And we'll get to that second chapter and how he's in the wrong, but maybe not factually incorrect. He's at least in soap jack territory. You're not wrong, Walter. You're just an asshole. Anyway, like one of the recurring themes that I see here is that Quoth is failing to respect Denna's agency, both in this chapter and the subsequent one. So we'll revisit that. So one of the things that we quickly learn is that Denna doesn't really need Quoth's help. She can handle herself pretty well. I want to cover one other little thing. Quoth is trying to make himself sound impressive by his tracking skills, by his climbing skills, by his being able to spy on the girl that he has a crush on without her noticing. He's trying to make what we all know is a terrible decision sound like something that we should give him props for. Yeah, there is a little bit of like, look at how awesome I am at playing Batman. It's not as impressive as he thinks. I mean, yeah, we get it. He's good at stealth. In this case, though, he is employing it for something that really he shouldn't be. There's a tiny mention of a sliver of moon above. Just going to put that one out there. You and I have had a discussion about how we actually care more about the relationships and the people in the story than we do about speculating about lore. And part of that is because there is a boatload of speculation about lore. If you really want to dive into the lore and dive into the meaning behind the poems and the meaning behind some of the discussions of the Chandrian or whatnot, there's tons of that available on the internet. But we're more interested in how the people relate to one another and how their personalities and character development happen. Of course, we're going to talk about the lore. There's no escaping it in this section. But I don't think that we're the right source for going line by line, trying to figure out the etymology of certain words. Yeah, I think the character relationships tell us more about who these people are as people. And it's these character relationships that make us really care about this book. That's what actually drew me into it. It was how the people interacted with each other. I would say that, yeah, Kvoth is in the wrong here. And you can also see how he would justify it to himself. A lot of it has to do with not just the stories that he tells other people, but the stories that he tells himself that informs his self-image, that informs who he is. And when that gets attacked, he doesn't handle it well. We're going to talk about that pretty extensively in the next chapter. So let's talk a little bit about the talk that Denna has with this girl that she saves in the alleyway. Well, first, I want to actually talk about the way that she saves the girl in the alleyway. We don't actually know how she knew about the girl in the alleyway or if she stumbled across the girl in the alleyway. Like, is this somebody that she met and then tried to keep an eye on and then 
had an inkling that something bad was happening? Or was Denna on her way to meet her patron? Or some other errand. Because it seems like, at this point, her plans have had a monkey wrench thrown in. Yeah, we don't know what Denna was up to, but it certainly didn't entail taking this girl out for a drink. Maybe it did, though. Could be. I mean, this is the first time that we've really seen Denna actually handle herself in a violent situation. It's always been hinted that she knows how. We know that she's carried a knife with her as long as Quoth has known her. But this is the first time that he's seen her have to use it. In every other situation that they've been together, whether it was, you know, up north of Traben, chasing down a drug-addled Dracus or whatever, most of what they were doing was just escaping. Also, that knife would have done absolute jack shirt sure. against a Dracus. Yeah, but this is the first time that Quoth has seen her in a confrontation where fighting was the right choice. And Quoth has illusions that he can handle himself in a fight. And he's not really convinced that anyone else can. Especially not a girl. He's definitely absorbed a lot of uh, sexist media in his time. What do you mean by sexist media? Because I want to know what you are thinking of. So I'm thinking of like all of these grand romance songs and these sort of chivalric traditions. He fancies himself Sir Savian and then his lover is Eloine. You know, all of these damsel in distress narratives. It's something that even as you can say, I'm not that guy, you still absorb all of that information and all of those stories and all of those parts of the culture, even if you are against it. I think he doesn't, especially at this point, really interrogate all of that. I mean, I know I didn't think very critically about that sort of thing at Quoth's age. And even if Quoth thinks of himself as enlightened, that's the biggest trap there is. That's when you just lie to yourself. Quoth does a lot of that. Also, after the altercation that he witnesses, he kind of gets into his head that he needs to go catch up with Denna. And only through sheer force of will does he prevent himself from doing that. Again, trying to make himself look better in this situation. I don't think that stumbling across Denna and the girl that she has taken under her wing is necessarily Quoth's best course of action. At every single one of these points, he has always had the option to leave. Yes. So when he first catches sight of Denna moving purposefully in a single direction, he always has the option of saying, oh, she looks like she's busy. I think I'm going to go somewhere else now. I'm not going to bother her. That's always been on the table for him. But he's just said, well, I can follow her. I got to know. Oh, now I need to keep her safe. But she can't see me. If she sees me, she'll freak out. Because you're doing something creepy, dude. Oh, now I'm watching her handle an altercation just fine on her own. I'm so curious that I can't rip my eyes away. Again, at every single one of these junctures, he's had an opportunity to say, you know what, this is more than I need to know. Maybe I should just back off. Maybe I should go home. Instead, he scrapes the crap out of his hands, rushing down the building without anyone noticing, somehow, and barely stops himself from catching up to the girl that he's stalking, and instead chooses to slip in the back way of the inn to eavesdrop on purpose with his finely tuned eavesdropper ears. As someone that is hyper aware of everything going on around me, I don't ever mean to eavesdrop, but I hear a lot of conversations everywhere in my vicinity whenever we're kind of in a crowded area. It is possible that this isn't a skill that he has adopted. This might just be that because he's gone through that much trauma, he might have an anxiety disorder or he might have hyper awareness that is essentially heightening his ability to overhear things in a crowd. Well, he's certainly choosing to use that for his own purposes right now. That is true. 
also no crowd. Yeah. And he even goes out of his way to bribe the waitress to leave him alone and not be too solicitous after his well-being. He has invested himself in trying to insert himself into the story that he has no part in. He's also trying to impress us yet again with his, it's not thievery skills, it's not really eavesdropping skills, but it's... Espionage? Maybe. It's something that I don't even think that a movie like Ocean's Eleven would try to fool us into believing could be real. It's ordering a glass of wine so dark that it's nearly black to create a makeshift mirror out of your glass. Really? I mean, that's kind of the now you see me to like BS with the card trick. Yeah, it's asking us to believe that this is more doable than it really is. My suspension of disbelief is just tatters at that. And I don't think it's a fault of Patrick Rothfuss's writing. I think it's a fault of Quoth. And I think that that's actually kind of a good thing that Pat wrote in to make us realize that Quoth just... Bullshirts. So much. Yeah. And he's only really able to pick up one side of the conversation because apparently Denna insists on speaking at full volume at all times. And Denna's scene partner is mumbling. <laughs> she uses perfect enunciation at all times. Although I will say when you do know someone, you are more likely to be able to understand them at a quieter volume than if you don't know someone because you know their verbal mannerisms and you understand their cadence and what they would normally say, what words they would normally choose. It's actually easier to lip read someone that you know than lip read someone that you don't. So it would also be easier to pick out the conversation of someone that you know, especially if they're talking quietly, but toward you. That's fair. So let's talk a little bit about that conversation. What we learn is that this girl apparently is from far away, has apparently moved to Severin chasing a boy, and now is finding herself being taken advantage of. I know he said he loved you. There is a concept of new relationship energy. Thinking that a relationship that is romantic in nature has moved on to the love stage is kind of a hallmark of that. Like if it goes just like super quick and you haven't known each other more than like a week and a half, there's this excitement and this new that is filling up your every waking moment. You don't know this person yet, but you're in love with them. And yeah, at this point, we realize that she's burned bridges with her friends at home, her family you know, all to pursue this person to the big city. And now she's got to figure out what she's going to do next. And Denna gives her some options. You know, she could become an apprentice at a trade craft. You know, that's perfectly respectable. You earn an honest wage. People will respect the work you do. She could go into the oldest profession. And even within that, there are different ways she could do it. She could just sort of be a low-class working girl, or she could become a high-class courtesan. I will say the part about Denna pitching her voice low, trying to calm this stranger girl like she would a horse. It's a tone that is designed to calm someone and set them at their ease. It's a skill, because it can also come off as patronizing and insulting. But it also is a mark to how gullible and how easily swayed this girl is. The other thing that we learn here is that Denna, I think, sees a little of herself in this girl. We don't know the specifics of what Denna's early life was like, but apparently she left home to pursue her fortune, whatever form that might take, and has been on her own ever since and has had to figure out how she's going to make her way in the world. Given that the society of the Four Corners is sexist, right? It is a sexist society. She's had to make some compromises and make some choices that 
she's not always proud of. She says specifically, meeting you is worse than looking in a mirror. Seeing a real life person pretty much emulating Dennis' path. Yeah. One of the things that I look at this is that freedom of choice doesn't mean freedom from consequence. Denna is someone who values her independence a lot, and she's had to make sacrifices for it, and it's cost her things sometimes. You know, whether that may be the fact that she's had to have relations with people she otherwise wouldn't want to have, or if it's giving up financial opportunities to be with people she enjoys, or having to leave town to keep herself safe. Now, did you see the part where it said, there is no young prince out there dressed in rags waiting to save you? It's that whole myth that that street urchin that you save is probably actually a prince in disguise. I want to bring this back to the larger story, though. Lorian and Arladin. Lorian ran off to be with Arladin, who is looked at as a leader of the troop of his people. And so in some ways, she did run off and found her prince. But, quoth, when Denim met him, dressed in rags, no anything to his name, and implications that he comes from at least a noble house. I mean, didn't the spin doctors write a song about this? Oh, dear. <laughs> I've got it stuck in my head now, so just go ahead now. You're adorable. And you're showing your age. I am. Anyway. <laughs> that was cute. Thank you. I think this is the first time that Kvothe has actually stopped to think about the prices that Denna has paid to be with him. Each of those dates that he's pulled her away from, each of those suitors that he's chased off, has represented a financial opportunity for Denna. Has been how she makes her livelihood has been how she gets to eat when she's not in the midst of a relationship, sort of. Each one of these suitors that he's chased off has been someone that she has been essentially serving and getting money from. And she's willingly still spent time with Kvothe, even at these opportunity costs to herself. These are choices that she has made, and Kvothe hasn't really respected what that's meant. But she's also never spelled it out to him. I will have to quibble a little bit with the idea that he should have known, because he had no basis from which to know this. She's not been upfront with him. He hasn't been interrogating anything. They're both either expecting the other to be a mind reader, or keeping everything so close to the vest that the other one cannot have any empathy for them. I think it's that latter one. They've both been so reliant on sort of these superficial pleasantries that they haven't given one another the opportunity to be truly vulnerable and show the full depth of who they are. So there is one other option that Denna laid out for the girl. You could go home. You've only been gone for a month. Your parents will probably just be relieved that you came home. They'll also hang over your head the fact that you left for your entire life. There are costs to everything. There is a monetary cost to become an apprentice. There is a social cost to going back home. There is a personal, very, very personal cost to becoming a courtesan. I am doing my best to convince you not to be a common street girl. I don't want to say the word that the... Me neither. Yeah. So you can see some of the costs and benefits that she's looked at throughout her life, trying to figure out how this could possibly be her best option. Like I said, we don't know the specifics of what happened, but this does give us the broad shape of it. And here's Denna laying it out for this girl exactly what it would cost her to do each of these various things. And she's got to make a decision. None of these are especially great choices, but they're the choices that are on the table. You also see Denna specifically railing against the idea that any man 
would own her. Her autonomy is the most important thing to her. And she's willing to pay for it. She does pay for it. It does close off certain avenues for her. And she owns that. So with that, let's move on to chapter 73, Blood and Ink. This chapter starts with a really lovely bit here where Kvothe meditates on the nature of secrets, specifically secrets of the heart versus secrets of the mouth. Also a little bit of philosophy. Yeah, I tend to gravitate towards that sort of thing. Tis catnip for Will. Yeah. We start with secrets of the mouth, which are those secrets that you kind of want to tell. The secrets that give you a sense of knowing. They're gossip. They give you the sense of superiority because you know something that someone else doesn't, and then you get to reveal it to them. And they're kind of poisonous. Like they poison society. They end up making it very difficult for people to live and be authentic with one another. And then there's this other, even deeper, darker one, which is these secrets of the heart, which are the secrets that you probably should tell, but you can't bring yourself to. You know, these are the secret guilts and shames, these things that are deep truths about yourself, your past, who you are, that your life would be so much better if you were able to speak of them, if you were able to be vulnerable with another person about them. And keeping these secrets actively hurts you, even as keeping the other secrets, the secrets of the mouth, you're probably better off keeping. Because otherwise you're hurting another person. These secrets of the heart only hurt you when you keep them. I would argue that that's not true. I would argue that they hurt your relationships also, and that they hurt the people that you are in those relationships with. Will and Sim are both very aware that Kvothe has secrets. And I think in some ways they are hurt that even with their closeness, they are not trusted well enough to be privy to any of Kvothe's secrets. They're not going to pry. They're not going to feel entitled to Kvothe's secrets, but they are not let in and they know that they are not let in. In fact, the only person that has been even mildly let in isn't even Denna. Not yet. It's Ari. I think that's pretty profound. Even then, I kind of get the sense that Ari has only been given the shape of those secrets. She knows the shape of them better than Will and Sim, but even she doesn't know the actual details, the content. She knows the exact boundaries of where those secrets lie. Like if you were to think of a map of Kvothe, she knows exactly what the secret shape continent looks like. What the void looks like. But she doesn't know what's in it. And again, doesn't pry because she respects Kvothe enough to know that he'll tell her if and when he feels like it. And Will and Sim, I think, are in the same category. They don't know the shape as well as Ari does even, but they also know that it is not their place to go prying. Denna avoids it completely, and Kvothe does not let her anywhere near it. Yeah, Kvothe keeps her at arm's length. She does the same to him. Absolutely. They both do it for one another. And I think what we're seeing is... I don't want it to sound like I'm judging these two people too harshly because both of these have been shaped by massive traumas around these secrets. These are things that they don't easily share and doing so is not something that they can just decide to do. I think the thing that's most telling here is that bit at the end of that opening section where Kvothe says the thing about secrets of the heart is that even as you recognize that you should share these and you want to, the longer you do, the harder it becomes. And it's nicely bookended at the end of this chapter, which we will get to. I agree. So while we can say that, yes, keeping these sorts of secrets of the heart is damaging to yourself and to others, we can also have compassion for the position of Kvothe and Denna and how they're dealing with this. So 
With that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about this little date that they have. And this is the first time that we see Kvoth and Denna show some of the edges of their personality, some of their darker sides, and attempt to show vulnerability. One of the things that has been very frustrating to me watching Kvoth and Denna is it feels like their relations to one another are happening through a pane of glass where they can't really touch one another. And they're kind of talking at or past one another pretty consistently. There's attempts to share deeper truths without speaking plainly. And it's this almost passive aggressive behavior. This almost, I can't say anything mean because then I will lose this person. Or I can't say anything mean because that wouldn't be polite. Well, and it's not even, I can't say anything mean. It's, I can't say anything honest. Right. So, for instance, I'm very blunt. No, really? Thanks. I'm very forthright. I'm open. I'm honest. I'm not mean about it. I find ways to say things that are honest and true without hiding it behind flowery language that could be misinterpreted. That's really my goal. I don't want to be misinterpreted. But there are some styles of conversations, like communication styles, that obfuscate the meaning of things. So the person receiving has to put in a lot of effort to guess what the person speaking is trying to say without actually saying it. And that's the kind of conversation I seek Foth and Dunna having all the time. Like they're putting little nuggets of truth in these back and forth exchanges that are almost like trying to put medication into like a pill pocket and make your cat eat it and not notice that the pill's there. I can see that. Like the other thing I see is this is where I think Kvothe is starting to get a little more open about the things that he judges about Denna. I think he's losing his patience, and I think that the shine has kind of worn off. Like, the things back to that NRE, new relationship energy. When you're in a brand new relationship with someone, you can ignore so much that would otherwise be like sandpaper against you. You can be okay with things that are against your principles, against your morals, you can look past them in the other person until that shine has worn off and until you really take the time to examine how you feel. Attraction can mask so much. It really can. So in this case, we see Kvothe once again needling her about continuing to work for Master Ash, continuing to have him as her patron. Like he doesn't really believe that Ash is her patron being dismissive over the patron relation. He's like, well, I can get you in with Mayor Alvaron. I'll introduce you. I can do that. I can set you up with him as your patron, as though she doesn't already have one. As much as she occasionally complains about Master Ash, and as much as he hurts her, she has not asked for a new patron. She's making the decision to continue this relationship. Whether or not we or Quoth feels it is a good choice doesn't really matter. The best that Quoth can do is be there for her to pick up the pieces. And I say this as someone who did have my fair share of abusive relationships. Sometimes you have to be there waiting in the wings to help when asked, but not insert yourself when not asked unless... It is a situation where someone is being actually hurt. I think Kvothe has this image of himself being able to ride in like some knight in shining armor to right the wrongs in her life and fix everything for her. But that's not what Denna wants. What Denna wants is to fix her own problems. She values her agency so much that the idea of having a traditional patron relationship actually kind of bothers her because 
she'd be relying on having to wear their colors and their influence to win recognition. It would be like somebody owned her. And she really doesn't like that. Not only that, but as I've said before, they generally were talking past each other, except she has been explicit that Master Ash is her patron. She has been explicit that she does not want Quoth's help finding a different person. She's been explicit saying that this is the situation she chose. And she accepts this choice and the consequences thereof. She hasn't asked him to insert himself into the situation. And so it quiets him down for a little while, but he's not really okay. He's probably still seething a little bit at this rejection and getting defensive because one thing that does happen a lot is someone saying, I'm just trying to help. And the other person saying, I don't want your help. And the receiving thing that they get, the interpretation that they make is they're rejecting me, not that they're rejecting my help or my advice. It becomes a value judgment on oneself in their own head. It doesn't need to be. So after they move past that little hiccup there, which is the first time we've seen a real speed bump in their relationship, right? It's always been super breezy, super easy. This is some actual... Friction. Yeah. And it sets the tone for the rest of their interaction. Denna is so excited and so happy to be able to share her song, her first song, something that she's been working on with the help of her patron for we don't know how long. Quoth doesn't know how long, so therefore we don't know how long. Quoth doesn't have a good understanding of how much research was put into this, so we don't have a good understanding of the research that was put into this. But she's carting a harp out to a random greystone near Severin. She's committed to this. She's excited for this. And it's a mark of just how much she values Quoth that she's willing to let him be the first person to hear this. Not even her patron. Right. This is a work of creativity. It is very sacred when someone shares something like that with you. It's so very personal. I made this. I poured my soul into this. This is for you to witness and experience. I'm so excited and so happy to share this with you. And Quoth is sitting there trying to enjoy the experience. And he's weaving a ring out of grass. And there have been a couple of different things about rings in this story so far. Making a ring to show mastery over an element. And also having a ring to show kind of debt versus ownership versus some other stuff in this social society of Severin. But there's also a little bit of, because he's doing it absentmindedly, he's letting his sleeping mind make a ring of grass. Interesting. So this is where we're going to get into a couple things, myth versus history. We've also got cognitive dissonance. There's some major cognitive dissonance that gets introduced with this story because Denna's song is about Lanray. The last time we heard about Lanray was Scarpy's story on the docks in Tarbian. And then before that, it was Arladin's song that brought the wrath of the Chandrian down upon the troop. This story is incredibly important to Kvoth. It's very personal to Kvoth, which is also something that Denna doesn't know. You cannot logically be okay getting angry with someone over something that they have no basis with which to understand how personal it is to you. So like when Quoth hears Denna's version of the story, which kind of flips the script compared to the one that Quoth has grown up with. I mean, it's kind of like the three little pigs and then the real story of the three little pigs. In this version, Lanre is this tragic figure who has been betrayed by the city of Myrterennial and by Selatos. Except not Myrterennial. It's I can't pronounce the other thing because I have a hard time with fantasy words. Mirantel? That. So in this version, it's Selatos that is the villain. It's not Lanre. Lanre isn't this hero who goes bad. 
in this version, it's actually Silatos who is the villain the whole time. And Quoth has really invested a lot of himself in Scarpy's version of the story. It's what's helped him to make sense of his parents' death. It's something that has been an organizing principle for his life. And so to have this challenged so directly by someone he cares about so much, I'd say it triggers an anxiety reaction in him. So even before that, Denna is almost possessive of Quoth and her relationship with Quoth, talking about Master Ash and requiring Quoth, putting down a rule that Quoth must not delve too deep into Master Ash's origin, must not try to find out anything about this man. This combined with Master Ash's help with the history behind this song solidifies more of the there was a relationship between Master Ash and Lan Ray. Solidifies the idea that maybe we're trying in this song, which should be sung for a hundred years or whatnot, will become legend, will become the definitive story of Lan Ray. Puts into question, again, who is Master Ash, and implies that it's someone who is definitely invested in whitewashing Lan Ray's reputation and making him into this tragic hero. I have some thoughts about that. First, though, I would like to talk about Quoth's reaction here specifically. So the thing about cognitive dissonance is that when you have a core worldview and then a new piece of information comes in that calls all of that into question, the emotional natural response is to reject the new piece of information. And that's where Quoth is. His reaction is not rational. It is also completely understandable. I think about you know, when we reevaluate Christopher Columbus, there are a lot of people who have looked up to Christopher Columbus as a hero. And so when that narrative got called into question, it oftentimes resulted in a very strong, angry reaction against it. You still see this. Oh, absolutely. Every time that Columbus Day happens in the United States, every year. Now, there are more and more people who are understanding that this is slowly being taken over as Indigenous Peoples Day. It becomes more of an infight than it becomes about celebrating the people who were brutalized. But you get all of these people who are so invested in their belief from like elementary school that Christopher Columbus was just this benign explorer that founded our country. That discovered this land. And then you find out that really he's just a right bastard. Yeah, I actually have a story about this. So growing up, I had a friend whose dad really idolized Christopher Columbus. Like he really bought into the whole age of exploration thing. He really bought the whole myth that Columbus was the first person who figured out that the earth was round. He really went all in on this. And in fact, even named my friend after Columbus. So when my friend got into high school, he was taking a history class and was told to pick a figure from history to write a paper about. So naturally, he had no choice. He had to do Columbus. So my friend went in and started reading. And you know, my teacher pointed him out to several other alternative sources that actually talked about the fact that even in his own time, Columbus was regarded as something of a monster. Like it wasn't like that was just the way society was. Columbus actually went back from the new world in irons because he was so brutal to the indigenous people of the Americas that his own people, his own crew thought it was absolutely terrible. There was a Spanish priest who basically led an indigenous revolt against Columbus and then wrote everything down and sent it back to Europe, to the Vatican. All of this history was there, but that narrative had been changed over the years because people in the United States wanted to talk about American exceptionalism 
and they wanted to talk about how there was a manifest destiny associated with this continent and particularly European settlers thereof. It was a subtle thing that happened. And so when my friend actually presented this paper to his father, his father practically disowned him. It was a major point of contention and he actually pulled my friend from the school as a result of it. There's no getting around the fact that for a lot of people, these narratives are parts of their identity. And so when they're exposed to an alternative narrative, to a view that challenges that worldview of theirs or that challenges their identity like that, the reaction isn't, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. I should adopt this. It's I must reject this with every fiber of my being. It's not to look for nuance and understanding. It's to reject and this is a cognitive bias that everyone has. Nobody is immune to this. You can be aware of it and you can try to mitigate it. But I think that there's going to be core beliefs every one of us holds, individual core beliefs that every one of us holds, that when challenged is going to bring up that defensive nature to one degree or another. And like I say, Kvothe has looked to Scarpy's narrative here to make sense of his entire life. It's what's given shape to the suffering that he's had because of the Chandrian. It's helped him make sense of everything here. And to have that challenged by someone he trusts like this, his reaction is this immediate rejection of it. And instead of actually talking about why he has this reaction. Because remember, this is a pain that he has not really shared with anyone. He hasn't talked about this with anyone at all for years. Ever since his parents died, he has not had anyone that he could feel safe and vulnerable with. He hasn't been able to tell where he's from, who he was, who his parents were. He hasn't been able to have any of that. And now he is feeling this understanding attacked and he can't bring himself to speak. He can't bring himself to really be vulnerable because he doesn't know how. Everything in his life has taught him how to not be vulnerable, how to avoid getting hurt. And so instead he bristles. He gets really angry in that quiet rage kind of angry. He can't think of the right thing to say, so he says something because he knows he's expected to say something. Denna has put so much trust into Kvothe. Kvothe, who she sees as her only real friend, despite the fact that neither one of them has really ever been vulnerable with one another on purpose without being inebriated. She is hoping for confirmation that she did well. She's hoping for someone who will be excited for her, someone to celebrate her accomplishment. And so when Kvothe's first reaction is to correct her pronunciation of Myrtorineal, and then to continue down this road of saying the wrong thing, but at least saying something, and telling her, you're wrong, this story is wrong, I've heard this story elsewhere. Who's to say that what he's heard elsewhere is real? Who's to say that Scarpy, who he didn't know from Adam, who's to say that that was the real, accurate story? Not the true story, because true stories don't necessarily have to be accurate. Like at this point, these are just two competing versions of myth. From different points of view. And when you're looking at prehistories like this, you know, there is a lot of room for interpretation. There's no primary sources. Yeah. And at this point, for Kvothe, it isn't about that, though, at all. It's because this is the thing that he has used to make sense of his suffering. The version of the story that Denna tells invalidates that suffering. And so Denna hasn't caught on and keeps pestering until Quoth says, you've got it all wrong. Everything is wrong. This doesn't match with what I was told. Lanray's a monster, not a hero. 
And he says something very hurtful that is a very big assumption of all your research was wrong. All of what you did was crap. There is absolutely no reason to believe that you got anything right. Why didn't you do this right? Yeah, his reaction is, I would say it's a triggered reaction. This is bringing up something that is so raw. It is opening a wound so deep in Quoth that he can't say the right things here. He can't take this diplomatically. He can't think about what is the least hurtful thing that he could say or the kindest thing he could say. All he can do is basically try and drive away the person that is hurting him, in this case, Denna. Honestly, he doesn't even have the wherewithal to think of what isn't a hurtful thing to say. He doesn't have to think of the nicest or the kindest thing. That's not the point. The point really is, don't be an ash. At this point, like I say, he is so repelled by Denna's version of the story. He can't contemplate doing anything other than pushing her away, insulting her. And I do think there is maybe also a part of him who, knowing what telling this story cost Quoth's father, perhaps he's hoping that if he scares Denna away, she won't suffer a similar fate. There might be some of that, but I don't think he's really thinking about protecting her right now. I don't think so either. I think that might be something that he might tell himself after the fact to feel a little better. But fundamentally, his reaction here is that of someone who has been hurt. And it does not go over well. And so, yeah, I can sit and say, yeah, everything Quoth did here and said here was wrong. But I can also have some compassion for the fact that this is the result of a trauma reaction. This is not him choosing to react or to respond in a way that is kind and loving for Denna. This is him throwing up all of his defenses because he is so hurt. And because he hurts Denna, Denna strikes back. And she says something that is interesting. This is just a myth. This is an old story. None of the places are real. None of the people are real. You might as well get offended at me for coming up with a new verse for Tinker Tanner. This is not the right thing to say either. Because Quoth to his core believes that all of these things, events, people, places are real. And he might be right. And he might be wrong. But to Denna, this is literally just taking a different interpretation of the story. And then Quoth tries, sort of to show a little bit of vulnerability. In the version I heard, I said, touching the far edge of my secret, Lanray became one of the Chandrian. You should be careful. Some stories are dangerous. And much like nearly everyone else in this time period, they all view, and Denna views, the Chandrian as a children's story that is meant to scare the living daylights out of young ones, and calls Quoth a child. They're supposedly around the same age. I think Den is older. But Quoth does not view himself as a child. He has not viewed himself as a child since he was objectively a child. Well, and his childhood was stolen from him. His innocence was stolen from him. And so, again, to have all of those hard-learned lessons invalidated and cast away further just alienates him. And so his next reaction is to lash out at her and start calling her stupid and her to get defensive and angry and insulted over that idea that just because he's been educated that she is stupid. This gets worse and worse until they leave. It includes things like you just think you know everything, and don't you dare try to fix me. And then at the end, Denna's like, you're like everyone else. I thought you were this special relationship in my life. I thought that you were different. I thought that you wouldn't hurt me, but you did. It's tragic. And this tragedy is only compounded when Kvothe gets back to his room, and he's had time to calm down a bit. 
And he knows exactly what he needs to do, which is to write her and tell her exactly why he had that reaction. In many ways, it's easier when you're having an argument to sit down and write it out, write out your explanation, write out your truth, your secret, because you can edit it to be what you actually mean. Because I know sometimes when you just spew out words, A, sometimes what you say isn't what you meant to say. B, sometimes what is heard isn't what you meant to say. And sometimes when all you do is just spew out words, you're not in a position to get to your point because you can get sidetracked by someone nitpicking. Sometimes a conversation, especially a heated conversation, cannot get laser focused on that target. So yeah, I think he's right in having that impulse to cool down a bit and then write about why he had that reaction and apologize. But he can't bring himself to do it. It's a case of weakness of will. And that's what makes it so tragic. There is a good that he knows he should do. It's something, in fact, that he wants to do. But no matter how hard he tries, those old defense mechanisms that have taught him to guard this secret closely, to never let anyone in on this, take hold. And he can't. He can't get past it. No matter how much he drinks, no matter what he does to distract himself, he simply cannot bring himself to unburden himself. It's a tragic situation here, and I'm not trying to judge either him or Denna because this is truly a tragedy. It is something where they had an opportunity to grow closer, and instead they pushed one another apart. They pushed one another away, and they hurt each other. That's the thing that really gets me in this. I'm not judging either one of them for their feelings, but I am going to judge them for their actions. They went out of their way to hurt one another. They don't know each other well enough to express all of their vulnerabilities, but they know each other well enough to harm one another with their words. Yeah, and I think they don't know themselves well enough to know how to be vulnerable with one another. Neither one of them are good at that. Denna, because of her way of life, means that guarding herself from harm has become her survival mechanism. It's how she protects herself. Being vulnerable is dangerous for Denna, just as it is for Quoth. Although I would say that for Denna, it is a much more tangible danger to herself. Quoth... I don't think would be in as much physical danger, except possibly from the Chandrian, but we don't know that. He has reason to believe that, though. Whether it is real or imagined, that belief shapes his behavior. These are lessons that are difficult to unlearn, and they are skills that take a long time to master. It's not like there are therapists in the four corners who can help people to heal from this kind of damage. I think the closest that we've got is probably clergy. Yeah, probably the closest to that that Kvothe has seen is Trappist. And that was a long time ago. So with that, I believe it is your turn to talk about the Phronemos. Oh boy, was there like no one, no good choices, none. So in the grand spirit of choosing a very obscure, because I have to, person, I'm choosing the waitress that took (laughs) the money and left Quoth alone. Yeah, absolutely. That's literally the only choice. Yeah. She did what was asked of her. She got paid for it. She took an opportunity that was plainly presented that wasn't difficult to accomplish and got a little bit of extra cheddar on top. I I mean, all you have to do in that situation is not fork up. Yeah. And she did it politely and kindly. Why, thank you. Here you are. Goodbye. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm with you. (laughs) I think that's probably the least bad option. 
Why, thank you. And with that, it is now time for you to talk about your interesting fact of the week. Thanks. I call this one, I'll have one crabby batty. So as scientists and engineers work on ways to clean up our energy infrastructure and make it more climate friendly, one of the biggest sticking points has been around batteries. After all, if you can't store energy, you can't really use it, no matter how clean your method of generation. Unfortunately, lithium ion batteries that power pretty much everything from our smartphones to our electric vehicles aren't easily biodegradable and they require rare and expensive heavy metals and the mining processes associated with that can be anything but clean, as well as these materials oftentimes being mined in areas with less than stellar human rights records, means that there's a pretty high cost just to store power. So vast quantities of batteries are being produced and consumed, raising the possibility of environmental burden. Liang Bing, who the director of the University of Maryland Center for Materials Innovation said in a press release, for example, polypropylene and polycarbonate separators, which are widely used in lithium ion batteries, take hundreds or thousands of years to degrade and add to the environmental burden. So what's the solution to this? Well, who and a team of researchers may have found a way to make a much more environmentally friendly alternative using crab shells, hence the title, Crabby Batty. Basically, this is because batteries work using a special substance called an electrolyte to shuffle ions or charged particles back and forth between the negative and positive terminals. It's important to get that plus and minus in the right position for that reason. That electrolyte can be a multitude of different mediums, but according to the new study's researchers, many batteries use flammable or corrosive chemicals for this function. Chemicals that aren't easily biodegradable, in other words. In contrast, for their battery, who and their colleagues called on a gel electrolyte that's found in a biological material named Cheetosan. Cheetosan is readily biodegradable, and it's found in crustacean exoskeletons like the pinkish tails of shrimp, crimson lobster carapaces, and crab shells, which are common food waste after a good seafood dinner. Those shells, the report continues, are often just dumped into a landfill or the sea, a costly form of disposal that can add up to more than $100 per ton, and one that's bad for the environment because landfills indirectly contribute to harmful gas emissions themselves. So from the standpoint of producing biodegradable batteries, imagine if all those expensive to throw away shells could be repurposed into something useful and helpful for protecting our planet. According to the team's new study, the Cheeto San used in its battery prototypes broke down completely within five months, leaving behind a metal component called zinc, rather than lead or lithium like standard batteries, which is actually recyclable. The prototype also has an energy efficiency of about 99.7% after 1000 cycles, meaning it's a viable option for storing wind or solar energy in power grids. That's a big improvement for the world of zinc batteries, because even though these power storage options aren't exactly new, they've been notorious for having a fairly middling efficiency. The researchers say the crab shell derived ingredient might be the missing piece that can take them to the next level. As of now, who says that including Cheetosan as an electrolyte in a battery means that about two thirds of the battery can be biodegraded, but going forward, the team hopes to tackle that remaining one third. In the future, I hope all components in batteries are biodegradable, who said. Not only the material itself, but also the fabrication process of biomaterials. All that being said, this is still in the prototype stage, and it's a far cry from being ready for production at an industrial scale. And there could be unpleasant knock-on effects if already depleted fisheries become a new energy source. However, with responsible shellfish farming or artificial fabrication techniques, engineers could find a way to store the energy collected from wind and solar farms that causes far less harm to our environment. What do you think? I think that that's cool. I think that looking into ways to combat some of the more prevalent arguments against renewable energy and against storing things in batteries is a good idea. As long as it's not with the intent of trying to shut up the naysayers and the trolls, because they're going to find new and exciting ways to just be a naysayer or a troll. But if you're doing it specifically to help the environment and encourage innovation in ways that doesn't harm our planet, I think that that's great. I think, I mean, the, the fact is battery production has been a significant issue, regardless of whether you're talking about electric vehicles or just the battery in your laptop or smartphone. The batteries in the laptops and the smartphones actually concern me a lot because who in the industrialized world doesn't have 
some form of something that's full of harmful chemicals. Like, what's going to happen to my 10-year-old laptop that I've been carting around and not doing anything with other than storing it once I'm no longer around to just cart it around and store it, right? There's so many things inside of those and so many of them. Absolutely. And there's only going to be more demand for batteries as we have increased demand for electric vehicles, for instance, because those are just right now running off of lithium ion batteries. And it's not like lithium ion batteries are a thing that is constantly being recycled. Right. You can't recycle them. But you can't reuse them either. Exactly. And so something like this that makes it easier to recycle them, that makes it easier to actually produce them, that is going to help meet demand and lower costs for electric vehicles. And it will also make it so that it is easier to produce replacement batteries down the line. On top of the fact that lithium ion batteries are using non-renewable resources that are quickly becoming scarce. Exactly. So yeah, it's a really cool thing and I'm going to be following this closely to see how well this progresses and to see if they can actually move this up to full production scale. So it's your turn for the thing of the week. So what do you recommend this week, Phoenix? All right, so forgive me if I've already recommended this because I know I wanted to recommend it and then I think I stuck a whole bunch of things in front of it and this would have been when we recorded in like April or May of this past year and I really don't remember if I ever actually got around to it but I wanted to. So if it's a repeat just understand that as soon as we're done recording and or editing all of our episodes kind of just get memory hold. Neither of us really remember anything about what we've said. Oh, well. But I think I just missed recommending this. And it is a graphic novel by Scotty Young, illustrated by, I think it's Jorge Corona. Either that or it's George, but it starts with a J, so I'm going to assume that it's Jorge. And it's called The Me You Love in the Dark. Something I think I've already said on the podcast, again, everything is memory hold. I don't really get scared while reading horror books. Like there's only been a couple of books that have stuck with me in that kind of psychological horror even. And with a book, it's a lot harder to do a jump scare. And I think that the only one of the Stephen King books that I read, because I read everything that was at all tangentially related at all to the Dark Tower. But the only ones that stuck with me at all, Bag of Bones stuck with me a little bit, but that was more psychological. And then Salem's Lot was the only one that really made me go, okay, that's really scary. Salem's Lot is such a good book. It really is. That one really stuck with me in that I'm actually scared of this way, not just well, that's creepy and invasive thoughts kind of way, but Salem's Lot was legit scary to me. But like, I read It, I read From a Buick 8, I read Insomnia, which was boring to me. I even read some of the ones that were under pseudonyms or written in conjunction with Peter Straub, and they were good. They were really well written, and they were things that I enjoyed reading. Enjoyed might not be the right word, but was engaged when I was reading. But not very many of them scared me. And so I have also had the same problem with like other graphic novels that are in the horror genre. Some of them are gross and they have body horror and it's like, ugh. And then some of them are just really good, like Lock and Key, super good, doesn't scare me. But The Me You Love in the Dark is so frightening to me. Like, it actually stuck with me for a very long time. It wormed its way into my psyche a little bit. With that very well-written, I'm impressed, this is legit horror kind of way. Which is a little bit interesting from the same person that wrote I Hate Fairyland, 
Yeah, it feels to me like if you were to take Nyarlathotep from the Haunter in the Dark and turn him into an abusive lover. The main story, I don't want to get too deep into it, but I will give a trigger warning. The story is about an artist who rents an old house that appears to be haunted. And the house itself manifests a presence that slowly starts controlling her life in the way that an abusive lover would, an abusive controlling lover would, cutting her off from her friends, from her agent, from her life, from even being able to leave the house, guilting her, gaslighting her, absorbing her uniqueness and desaturating it. And I can point to some of the reasons why this scares me so much. And it's because I lived with someone who was very like that. But the way it's written and the way it's illustrated is just so visceral. It's so well done. It had me crying. It also had me very frightened for the protagonist. And I couldn't put it down. I needed to see what happened. Mind you, like, the things that I know Scotty Young from, again, I hate Fairyland. It's almost Ren and Stimpy-ish, but very clever, and an interesting twist on the fairy tale genre. But the thing that I discovered Scotty Young with was when he did the illustrations for Eric Schenhauer's The Wizard of Oz comics, graphic novels through Marvel. And I really love those. I love his art style and everything. He didn't draw this one, but that's where I knew him from. And to see this kind of depth and this kind of drastic difference from the other things that I've seen that he's written and that he's illustrated, it shows that people shouldn't be typecast and that there isn't just one type of thing that somebody can create and that you can have talent and skill that is broad, but still deep. It's the way many actors originally become known for comedic roles and later in their life learn to tap into a well of sadness and portray much more serious things. I mean, today Tom Hanks is America's dad and he's known for very serious acting roles, but he got his start doing comedies. Similarly, Robin Williams, when he turned his hand to dramatic roles, was actually really good. And these weren't always cuddly, friendly roles that were characterized by warmth. They could also be incredibly dark and disturbing ones, like in One Hour Photo. But yeah, I think there is a depth and seriousness to the me you love in the dark that you would be forgiven for not expecting. But it really is a very well-constructed and pretty frightening slow burn of a tale. Because it doesn't start out super scary. It just slowly builds with each little small thing until you have an avalanche of terror. And I think that that's part of the genius of it and part of why it was so visceral to me. People that are manipulative, people who gaslight you, people with sociopathic personality disorders, antisocial personality disorders, do not come on strong in most cases. And in this case, the house started off with almost a friendly presence, a curious presence. Who are you? What are you doing in my home? And then there would be outbursts. And then, and I'm sorry, let me make it up to you. Let me fix this. And then getting the person back on their good graces. And then slowly turning up the heat on how often an outburst would happen or turning the hurt back on the person saying, well, if you didn't do it this way, I wouldn't have to be angry. And it just showed how insidious an abuser can be. Very well done. Might not be for everybody, might not be something that everyone can tolerate, but it is so well done. And if you can, and if you want 
to see a very clear understanding of why does someone stay in an abusive relationship? Why does someone have to go through so much to get to a place where they are no longer able to tolerate an abusive relationship? This does such a good job of showing that. Well, that's a good recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, let's go ahead and share our seven words. I believe you have the words from the book this week. I do. And I have like three choices that are pretty good, but also in highlighting Denna's dialogue specifically in this section, I came to the realization that a lot of her dialogue is actually quite mean to Quoth in this. There's what kind of a child are you? There's also, you think you know everything, don't you? That's what it's all about, isn't it? There's just so much. Fool, I haven't played you anything yet. Even when she's trying to do a little bit of banter, she's being kind of insulting. And I can't choose any of those. So the things that I want to look at more are some of the seven word sentences from Kvothe's rumination on Tekum, and I think that that's a more lovely part of this section. Certainly a wiser one. I mean, like, there are some things in the previous chapter that I could choose, like, there was a sliver of moon overhead. I know he said he loved you, and I recognized the pitch of her voice, but none of those really spoke to me. So let's go over the three that kind of got me. The first one is actually from Dinna. You'll serve me best as audience today. I think that that one's good, mostly because Quoth keeps being like this little eager puppy saying that he wants to play with Dinna and do a bunch of stuff to like help her. And Dinna's like, I want to stand on my own two feet. Thank you. Yeah, she's drawing some boundaries there. Which I think is good, but maybe not in the way she's doing it. But then we've got a secret is true knowledge actively concealed. And that speaks so much to Pat's cadence and poetry in his prose. And then we've got Tekum understood the shape of the world, which only really makes sense in the context of this book. I think the second one, secret is true knowledge actively concealed, is our better choice just overall. I think there's some true wisdom there and it makes a lot of sense and it's applicable to whether you are a fan of the book or just someone who happened to stumble on our podcast. Or our Instagram, if I ever actually catch up to it again. All right. So my words are, Ang Lee's Hulk is an underrated masterpiece. Okay, I know exactly why you did this. I said what I said. For the record, this is a reference to a, I guess I'm just going to call that a prank. It was a prank. (laughs) A dear friend of mine was asking for movie recommendations and on a whim, I just told her, yeah, you know, Ang Lee's Hulk movie is actually a lot better than people give it credit for. And as a result, our friend ended up watching that movie like, five or six times trying to figure out what I might have been seeing in it. She is tenacious. She was very angry at me that I'd wasted so much of her time with that bad wreck. And she lets it hang over my head to this very day. How long ago was this? This would have been back in 2013, 2014 thereabouts. Yeah. So coming up on 10 years soon. That's hilarious. Sometimes my recommendations are good, and sometimes they're Ang Lee's Hulk. I promise that none of my recommendations for this podcast are Ang Lee's Hulk. You promise that none of your recommendations on this podcast are trolley recommendations. I promise that none of them are Ang Lee's Hulk. Fair enough! (laughs) Though most of the time you are sincere. Yeah, absolutely, except when I'm not. And I'm not going to tell you what's what. With that, I'd like to thank you for potting with me. Thank you for potting with me. And thanks for listening to Tales from the Waystone. Join us next time on Tales from the Waystone as we cover chapters 74 through 76 of The Wise Man's Fear through the lens of Off the Beaten Path.
We would like to thank our friend Shawnee Jang for our theme music. And many thanks to Patrick Rothfuss for creating a world that we've enjoyed exploring. Audio production, editing, and social media coordination, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. And writing and project management, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. If you would like to help support us and possibly get some extra perks, and you have the means to do so, please consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash waystonepod. And just so that you are aware, there is either something that just showed up or will show up soon, because I can't remember dates that things are going to release. Sorry. A new Sandman episode over on our Patreon. And I think our coverage of Season of Mists was quite well done, if I do say so myself. And we'd love it if more people wanted to listen to it. Also, give us feedback. And with that, here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses. Ding! Ding. My clip is being floppy. Oh no. Okay. Have you resolved your clip flop? I have resolved my clip flop. Clip flop, clip flop, clip flop, like a horsey. I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs>